Perfect. So let's see, can you guys hear me in the back? Wave if you can hear me. Awesome. Hi. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so my name is Emil Afrem, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Neo4j, which is uh, a graph company, which we'll talk a little bit more about today. Um, I'm here to do something extremely simple today. I'm just going to tell you four stories, uh, four stories about connecting the dots, about finding connections in data, two stories about the past, one story about this week, and then one story from the future. Very simple, four stories. First of all, I'm going to try out the theory that you can hear me and keep this a little bit interactive. Who here has heard of the Paradise Papers? Hand raised. Awesome. Most people in the audience. It is uh, by far the biggest news story of this week worldwide. Um, and s considering how things seem to be unfolding, I predict that it's going to be probably the biggest news story for several weeks and even months to come. So let's take a little bit of a peek behind the scenes of this story. The heroes of this story are two German journalists that work at a newspaper out of Munich, München, called Süddeutsche Zeitung. And these guys were presented with a big data leak of 1.4 terabytes of data from an offshore tax law firm called Appleby. And this data supposedly detailed bank accounts and information that the rich and powerful use for legal tax planning, but potentially also for illegal tax evasion. So you got this massive dump of data, 1.4 terabyte, terabytes of data, about a year ago. And what they did is that they contacted an organization called the ICIJ, the ICIJ with whom they had collaborated before when they worked on the big Panama Papers which was one of the biggest stories of last year until probably the Brexit and the US election, so at least for most of, most of last year. And they got this massive dump of data, spaghetti information, that they had to try to make sense of, and they ran it to, through this massive open source pipeline of technologies where they OCR'd it, they analyzed it, etc., and they ended up with 13.4 million documents, emails, scanned uh, government forms, um, those kind of things. And this, by the way, 13.4 million documents makes this the biggest leak in journalistic history. And what these guys had to do then is try to uncover stories in here. Is there anything newsworthy in all of this information? So the qu big question then is how did they do this, right? And so let's take a step back and talk about investigative journalism. Investigative journalism is all about finding patterns. It's about finding how things are related, how things are connected, but not how things are directly connected. That's obvious. The hidden in plain sight doesn't really exist in investigative journalism. If you're directly connected to something, it's obvious you'll see it. It's about finding the things that are indirectly connected. So let's look at an example pattern. We have a person who has an account with a bank. This person is you, right there, and me. And you, and, and, and all of us. This is, there's nothing weird and fishy about this. Like, this is, this is true for all of us. But what if we build on this pattern? This person lives at an address. At that address, another person lives who is an officer of a company, and that company has a bank account in an offshore tax haven. All of a sudden, this is becoming kind of interesting, right? Nothing is directly connected to this person, but this person seems to be indirectly connected to an offshore bank account, right? So in the data world, we call these things graphs. Specifically, if you look at these things, persons, accounts, banks, etc., and we take more of, a, more of a conceptual view, we call the rings nodes, and we call the arrows, the connections between them, relationships. And if you add properties to this, key value pairs, first name, MO, last name, Aframe, those kind of things, with those three building blocks, nodes, relationships, and properties, you can model everything. Everything. It turns out when you have these building blocks and you build your application, you get all kinds of interesting advantages. This is a much softer model that is easier to evolve as business requirements change if you build an application. You can easily evolve your schema with it. It's a very flexible model. For example, if we wanted to add 
I don't know, a social network to this. We just add more people. But if we then want to say that, hey, we want to turn this social net network into an auction side or a classified side, we just add nodes with the type uh, objects that, that are up for sale. It's very easy to evolve the model. That's very powerful. But what's even more powerful is if you wrap this as an infrastructure that can handle not just one, two, three, four, five, seven nodes, but 1,000 nodes, or a million nodes, or 13.4 million nodes, or for that matter, a billion nodes, or 10 billion nodes. Getting back to our story, so they've done this before. The ICIJ, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, these journalists, they've done this before with the Panama Papers. And the example that I took right now was actually not a fictional example. It was the example of this guy, whose name some of you in the audience, the Scandinavian audience, may be able to pronounce it. I'll give it a shot. His name is Sigmundur Gunnlaugsen who's the former prime minister of Iceland, who had exactly this pattern where he was not directly connected to an offshore bank account, but he lived at an address, another person lived at that address, that person subsequently turned out to be his wife, was an officer of a company, that company had a bank account in an offshore tax save, and he had to resign over these findings because he hadn't disclosed it. Right? More recently, from this week, the Paradise Papers, we're starting to see some things unfolding here. This story broke yesterday. This is the uh, Donald Trump's Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross, who turns out that he is not directly, but indirectly connected to the son-in-law, the, the gentleman who's married Putin's daughter. Right? He's not directly connected, he's indirectly connected. If you can follow these links, if you can follow these connections, you can start to uncover some pretty amazing things. I believe in the Paradise Papers. There's going to be a lot more news of this style over the next few months and, and, and hopefully weeks. The Panama Papers had a massive impact, written about in virtually any major newspaper in any, any country of the world. The same is, is true already of the Paradise Papers. Um, and ultimately, the ICIJ won the, the Pulitzer Prize uh, for the Panama Papers. That's the type of impact that you can get if you can follow connections in data. So that's my first story. My second story is about a completely different field. It's the world of medicine. And specifically, one of the most important missions, I believe, that is going on in the world of medicine, maybe even in the world today, which is this. This is unfortunately one of the few things that unifies all of us in this room. If all of us, I bet, are, if not one, at least at most two hops away from someone that has been impacted by cancer. Right? And it turns out that when you are looking for the cure for cancer, that's a very complex topic with a lot of ingredients into it, a lot of moving parts. You have the compounds selections that you're doing, you have the trials that you're doing, you have the genetic history of the individual, you have their medical history, you have their diets, their habits, like all of these things and all these factors are related. They're connected, they influence one another, right? It's a big connected problem. The challenge is that in this industry, the way that people work with data, this is now a data problem. As with so many problems in the world, this problem has turned out to be a data problem. And the challenge is that the kind of history and the legacy in all of these uh, companies doing cancer research and organizations is that they have data that is very, very poor at working with connections. Right? They store it in classic relational SQL databases, which are amazing. Right? It's one of the best pieces of computer science and, and engineering that I've certainly seen in, 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 in the world of software. Right? The relational database is amazing, but it's not good at connected data. Right? So not only do they have that, they have also data stored in these disparate, disparate silos. So we have a, like a one-two punch problem here, right? Where the data is stored in, in technologies that are poured uh, with connections, but then they're also spread out across silos, right? So what if you could take a database, a graph database that is awesome at doing connections, put all this data in one thing that unifies all of these systems, and then all of a sudden you can see that, hey, this particular trial that we did with this particular compound actually is affecting this segment of the population with these habits in the following way. And all of a sudden, you, uh, insights emerge that will hopefully lead to finding the cure for cancer. I now know of eight independent projects that are using Neo4j to look for the cure for cancer, and nothing makes me more proud than the impact that I hope we're going to have in this field. So that's my second story. 
The third story is um, in a completely different field again. This is a story about space. Specifically, it's a story from uh, Houston, Texas, and the Johnson Space Center, which is the home of Project Orion. And Project Orion is uh, an amazingly cool project for the, for the inner geek in me. Well, I have both an inner and an outer geek for the geek in me, I guess, um, because it's the mission to take us to Mars, right? And, and that mission is, is, of course, very exciting uh, along so many engineering axes. But one of the problems is that they very recently land, ran into a massive challenge. And they had a problem with what's called the uprighting construct of the space capsule. And the uprighting construct is what the escape capsule is using when it splashes into the water, right? It can be um, twisted and turned in every, in every way, but you want something to turn it uh, so that it's facing upwards because it carries four astronauts and you would like for them to be able to get out of the escape capsule, right? And in all the tests and the simulations that NASA did, it failed. It failed. So the good thing is that this is not NASA's first rodeo. They've been sending you know, people and things to space for over, over 50 years. And they are, I don't know, maybe the best engineering organization in the world or something like that, right? And they've been extremely disciplined about recording not only their successes, but more importantly, their failures, where they've tried certain things and it hasn't worked out. Right? And what they did to then fix that, right? And they call that their lessons learned database. So it's this record of 50 years of, of NASA engineering knowledge. It's an amazing trove of information. And so when they had this problem with the uprighting construct, they tried to look in this, in this lessons learned database. And the, the good thing was that it used the same construct as the legendary Apollo missions, right? The ones that got us to, to the moon, whatever, 40 years ago. Uh, and so that was good news. So there could be something in there. But they looked, and they looked, and they looked, and they couldn't find anything. It took months to look through all this information, couldn't find anything. They even got so desperate that they started finding old astronauts from the Apollo era, went up into their attics to look at you know, old replicas and constructions and try to figure things out, but couldn't find anything. So then David Meza, the chief knowledge architect at, at NASA, he got this idea. Wait, what, what was it that made Google work? Well, Google shifted from this kind of tabular, disconnected view of the world where you only looked inside of every document into a world where like, hey, we're going to look at the links connecting these documents. And every link is like a vote on that document. And if a lot of people link to something, we're going to surface that high in the search results. That's a graph. That's connected data. So he said, what if we could take this data and we could move it over into a graph database? They did that, and in three hours, they'd find, the con find a, a fix to the problem. And ultimately then, they made the fix, it worked, and the mission was back on track. They're on the record saying that thanks to this, um, um, they saved two years' worth of engineering and millions of dollars. So basically, thanks to the entire community of graph database users now, mankind is going to be on Mars two years earlier than before. And this makes me just very, 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 very excited and giddy. So that's space. It is investigative journalism. It is um, cancer research, medical research. So what are graphs being used for today from, from a more commercial perspective? Well, we've seen a number of use cases emerge for, for graph databases over the past couple of years. And, and, and probably half of the, the de deployments that we see today map to one of these five, six use cases. And the first one is real-time recommendations. Real-time recommendations is a super popular use case. Seven of the 10 biggest retailers in the world, including the biggest retailer on the planet, Walmart, is using Neo4j. And a very popular use case is real-time recommendations. Other people who bought this also bought that. That's all about finding patterns in data. So very common. Fraud detection, many of the biggest banks in the world use um, Neo4j to find fraud rings. They use connections in data to figure out that, hey, we have a number of transactions that in and of themselves are OK, but they connect into a fraud ring, a very popular use case. Network and IT operations is all about building up a massive model of your big telco network or your big data center. And then you'll see if you have a breach over here, how will that cascade across your entire network? Or if this cell tower um, falls down, how will that impact everywhere else in, 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 in your telco network? Um, another very popular use case is anything around master data, so looking at data lineage. 
looking at um, organizational hierarchy. That's a lot about connections, a popular use case. And then finally, identity and access management, figuring out that this person belongs to a group, that group belongs to a group, and they have this access information to this pieces of content which may live in different folders. That's a big, very connected problem and something that we see very commonly uh, used in terms of graph databases. So that's kind of my two stories about the past, my story about this week, about the present, and then finally to my fourth and last story, which is um, a story about the future. Prior to that, though, let's have a little bit of a look at what unifies these three stories that I, that I told already. And really, the, the thing that unified it is that people had a lot of data, but they were held back by legacy technologies, right? And you know, I mentioned before that I'm a big fan of the relational database. There's also a lot of other databases out there that are very good, like document databases and key value stores and things like that. They're very scalable. They're persistent. They like, have all kinds of good things about them. One thing that I fundamentally very much disagree with, though, is that I believe that they have a very simplistic view of data. They have what I call the store retrieve pattern, where you take data, you write that into that database, and then later on, you can acquire exactly that data, retrieve exactly that data back out again. Right? And that's it. Yes, scalable. Yes, performance. Yes, all these things. But fundamentally, that's all they do. With Neo4j, with graph databases, we have much higher aspirations than that. What we want to do with a graph database is that when you write data into it, you attach it to the rest of the world. Right? You take your connected data, and you attach it to the rest of the world. Right? And so when you then subsequently query that data, you get context back. Right? You get how that thing relates to everything, either directly or indirectly in the world. And in that context is hidden the cure for cancer. Right? That prime minister you know, that's potentially connected to an offshore tax account, the, the fix to the operating construct for NASA, but also the, fra the fraud detection at your big bank or the real-time recommendations that you want to do. That context is what provides what we call actionable insights, which is a much higher level of aspiration and ambition for our database than the simple story retrieve pattern. All right, so to the fourth and final story uh, about the future. So probably the most hyped term uh, at Web Summit uh, this year is machine learning. Like, I now, as I walk around and I, and I look at startups here, I get shocked if I find a startup that is not doing machine learning, right? Um, and, I mean, and, and we all know that then they're doing VR or AR instead, right? Um, so it's a super hyped Word, but it's one of those things, much like the internet in the late 90s, in that it is, it's extremely hyped, but actually from a long-term impact perspective, it's very likely underhyped today. It is, I believe, the singular most tectonic shift going on in our industry right now, bar none. Right? And one of the interesting things about machine learning for me as a, as a graph geek is that machine learning is all based on graphs. Once you start looking into all of these algorithms and operations that they do, almost always are they expressed as graphs, right? This was uh, some, a, a useful taxonomy that I found over various parts of, of, of machine learning and AI. I, we, we didn't put this one together, but it, it strikes out to us, right? Because if you look at all these different subparts of artificial intelligence, the way that they um, describe them is through graphs, right? So I think that graphs have a very fundamental role to play in the future world of machine learning and, and AI. And one of the most stark examples of this is knowledge graphs. Right? So knowledge graphs is something that Google popularized a couple of years ago. When you go to Google and you search for Lisbon, right, you're going to get some hits about Lisbon, but you're also going to get this pane where it talks about actual content, semantic information about Lisbon. That helps you make sense of that. Right? This is what gives context. Right? And what's interesting about context is that context is the one thing that drives meaning and precision for these uh, machine learning systems. And context is all about how we relate to the world. This is a picture of me-ish. And if, if I tell you that my first name is Emil and my last name is Ephraim, that tells you something about me. But if I tell you how I relate to the world, I've, I'm the father of two daughters which is actually not true, because as of five weeks ago, I'm a father of three daughters, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I work at this company called Neo4j. I'm married to Madeline. I play the piano. I watch the Matrix movie, which is what that's supposed to depict, right? 
I was born in Sweden, and I actually don't drive a Tesla. This is fake news. I want to drive a Tesla, but, but I don't, right? This is what gives me color. This is what makes you understand me, right? And this is one of the things that you can capture in a knowledge graph, which will really drive meaning and precision for your machine learning systems. And there's a lot of people talking about this, and there's a lot of deployments out there where we see knowledge graphs being used. The, the coolest one that I know of is used at eBay, where eBay has this, this shop bot project, which is their approach for conversational commerce. You can connect to a Facebook uh, messenger buddy, a bot, and then you can chat with it. Or over voice, you can say, hey, I want to shop this and that. Or you can take a picture of some sunglasses. It'll find equivalent to that in e eBay's one, you know, billion item inventory. right? They have all kinds of fancy technology to make that work. But ultimately, in order to make sense of that world, break all this down, they store it all in Neo4j. Right? So that's how they use the resolve bags to either a handbag or a men's backpack, depending on all that context. Right? So this, I believe, is going to be one of the, the most uh, important and exciting use cases for graphs in, in the future. So I'm going to leave you with one thing before I rapidly get off stage, um, which is that the best database on the planet out there, the one that inspires me the most, is actually the one that I was pointing at before, which is that database right there, which is the human brain. Right? If you think about what a graph database is, it's about neurons connecting to other neurons with synapses. So my one thing that I want to urge all of you here at this conference is to take inspiration from that. Don't be static in square tables. Don't be isolated documents. Go out and connect with people and enjoy the conference. Thank you very much. <laughs>